That was Len Cutter. <laughs> okay, next, uh, there's no guitar or instruments or anything. Mr. Wrong Hero, sir. It's just him. It's just him, the wrong hero. Please welcome him. Yeah. Or else. Fight! 
has to date from before the industrial era. Stuff like, you know, son, money isn't everything. Then why don't you give me some? Well, you know, money doesn't grow on trees. I know money doesn't grow on trees. It falls from your fat wallet, fool. Now fork it over. Pronto. Act like a spaniel. Son, you know, you catch more flies with honey than you do with vinegar. Great, we're going to start a fucking carp farm here. Great, we'll, we'll go into business. Fly catcher and son incorporate. Well, you know, son, you can't make a silk purse out of a sow's ear. Do I look like the kind of guy who wants to walk around the wall and made a fucking bacon? <laughs> well, you build a better mousetrap and the world will beat a path to your door. Wouldn't it be cheaper and easier to let construction workers do it? <laughs> People who live in glass houses shouldn't throw stones. Glass houses, great, brilliant idea. They're just what, so burglars can window shop? Glass houses, so you can look at the wall and shave. Glass houses, so so you know when you're when you're fucking on Saturday night, the neighbors can stay outside and hold up scorecards. Nine point nine, eight, ten. in imitation. Now, Herman Melville said that, but he hasn't been gigging lately, so I figured he wouldn't mind. Oh, they're all good, well, thank you very much. Hey, thanks. And, um, he'll be batting that around, uh, on, uh, the General Electric Panel Discussion Show. This Sunday at 6 a.m. Uh, on channel 56. Our next act is David Garcia. Come on. Hey, thanks. I was definitely not on the job killer side, but we could always do with some seriousness around here. And uh, speaking of, of seriousness, the next person coming up is really on a heavy trip. You're about to be transformed metaphysically and surrealistically by none other than the wrong hero who's videotaping this tonight for cable access. So please welcome the wrong hero. Big money, big money! And Vanna White rolls out a 
giant stone coin from the island of Yap. <laughs> Sure do. And it's good! Mercury's glove! We're 
triples go to die. And now, Hercules steps up to the plate. He's swinging seven bats. Wait a minute, the game has been called. Mount Vesuvius is erupting. All the gods are going to put it out, and Hercules is going to roast some weenies. While we're taking this break, I'd like to remind you that this all-god baseball game is brought to you by Red God Beer. Red God. Because you are your own god. How do you get ideas like this, Rome Hero? You may be asked how you sell like this, Rome Hero. Well, I used to do this. I used to go, shh. <sighs> Not the actual dope, you know, just the deep breathing does it for me. But, no, time wise, you know, I get stoned. I, I go over to, uh, what's that place, uh, that ice cream store up the street? What's it called? The ice cream store up the street. The ice cream store up the street. Toscanini's, yeah. I walk in there and, you know, I'd be stoned. I mean, one eye would be the size of a pinprick, the other would be the size of a dinner plate. And I'd walk in there and go, I'd like a triple decker ice cream cup. Give me one scoop grapefruit sorbet, one scoop death by chocolate, and let me see now. One scoop coffee, cappuccino, almond bark, chewing tobacco, Mexico City card sauce, few pink for the red. Here, kitty, kitty, here, kitty, kitty. Spotted owl, dolphin free, tuna, beach whale, koala, eucalyptus, tangerine, mango, coconut, recombinant DNA, malted mastodon crunch. And uh, don't put it in a cone. Give it to me in a monkey's paw. <laughs> And they're very nice. They'd say, oh, is that for here or to go? Yeah. One number seven. Hey. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm going to leave you now. Oh. Oh, yeah. well, come on. Well, no, no, really I have to. But, uh, you know, these scientists talk about how, well, there might be life on other planets, but they might not be carbon-based. They might be silicon-based. And so when silicon-based aliens land on this planet, <laughs> jump out of the rocket ship, <laughs> Oh, since their heads are made of silicon, however, they spring right back. And they say, take me to your nudie bars. I want to see your artificially enhanced women. And I'm the wrong hero, and uh, I thank you very much. Here's something. 
There's an observational here that's so beloved of people who watch stuff like Jerry Seinfeld. If there were no school, ice cream trucks would roll the streets the year round. Well, anyway, I'm the wrong girl, and I've been all over this great country. I've been from radioactive landfill, Washington State, to pink shit lagoon, North Carolina. I've been from Dinewaukee, Florida, to poking me out of the sharp stick, Florida. No, Nevada, sorry. I've been from Chumley, Ohio, to Dorothy, Tennessee. And I need to tell you something. Everything west of Chit and everything east of Southernsville, California, is basically toxic waste, smoldering landfills, and frontier justice, where filled with infested, lice encrusted hits, twiddled and non opposable thumbs, all the live long day while watching the great elevator go up and down. And now, I'd like you to hear this before I go. Time is limited. I'll act it out. a special added treat. The Wrong Hero deconstructs all my children in three minutes and under. Well, first of all, you have the interminable ads. Then we have Haley. She's a workaholic. That's because she used to be an alcoholic. Now, Haley is yelling at her underling. And now there's something about um, Tad Martin and Janet Green and Louis Greco. And no one wants to buy a gun. It's time for the logo. Eric is hardly even appearing at all. Ah, now, it's uh, the ambitious TV director and the owner of the station and, and the felon and uh, there's Brooke who's the boyfriend of the guy who the girlfriend of the guy who owns the station I want to buy me a gun no don't be a fool ah now it's a wedding fantasy now it's a medicine fantasy and now it's a sports fantasy and now it's a gluttony fantasy and a fantasy about a teddy bear and now there's an ad for another one and here we go uh, there's Haley yelling at her underling again uh, you know, you really ought to get yourself a life. You're not drinking, are you? Oops, now we're in another thing now. What is this, anyway? Oh, I don't know. Oh, I just bought you a TV station. You're kidding. No, I'm not. Well, uh, we're on TV now. I'm interviewing this murderess. Well, I must say, you, you saved the life of my child. That's great. Well, you better spice up the act, because it's not so hot. Oh, uh, commercials, babies. Charlie Brown, the beloved Charlie Brown. And more medicine and stuff, and, and oh, it's, uh, more medicine still. And now we're back to the nitty-gritty. I, you better spice up the show. I want to see some action here. Hi, I'm the ambitious TV person. Uh, we're going to put the convicted rapist on, this, on the same stage as the victim. Now, I'd like to ask you, whoops, too late. Okay, um, uh, more fantasies here. Uh, products, medicines, crap, uh, chicken, uh, uh, lose some weight. It's the beloved 
Guido Sarducci. Oh, here we go. We're putting her on the same stage as her victim. Whoops, nope. Oh, I want to thank you for saving my life. I had plastic surgery. I used to be a felon and I murdered somebody. Now I'm back on the right track. Well, I'm going to have a baby. Oh, oh, isn't this wonderful? Charlie Brent, whose name means Wild Goose, and his new girlfriend are getting married. Now it's time for the commercials. Uh, take lactate. Cinderella, indoctrinate your children. Cream of wheat. This tasteless crap. Jazz it up. Uh, and that wonderful ad for the uh, paste piccani sauce. Uh, thick and chucky, pick up the pace. That's pretty sexual, isn't it? Now we're back with all my children here. Uh, well, I don't know what the hell's going on here. Um, well, to tell you the truth, uh, I like having the uh, be on a t television station, but oh, it's Sinbad, the beloved Sinbad. Everybody loves him. Baby, Emodium AD, Fry Daddy, Playtex, Silk, some sort of silk thing. I don't know, probably for women. Uh, now I'm having a flashback of how it used to be with me and Charlie Brent. My alcoholic mother tells me I'll never be happy, and she's right. So I guess I'll just sit here by myself. Hi, I'm Louis Greco. Whoops. Uh, Noah just pushed him and started strangling him. And now it's the commercials. It's the end of the show, by the way. Uh, yeah, all sorts of products and stuff. You know, don't let baby have diarrhea. Oh, uh, now it's all my children. Hi, I'm Denny Moore, Mrs. Denny Moore, that is, to you. The end.
that's why he hangs out with 12 guys. Fishermen know that. There's sailors. Thank you. 
Nathan Hale's cat, who said, as he marched to the gallows, I regret that I have but nine lives to give for my country. Now, uh, another one that I'll talk about is, uh, what if the British, during the War of 1812, had had the atomic bomb? You know, our national anthem would probably go something like, Oh, say can you...
my time already, but you know, an hour seems like a minute up here, and I'd like to thank you all very much. My name's Ron Hero. I hope to be back next month.
See, see, I knew, I knew that somebody would have to finish it. <laughs> well, um, you know, I don't even know why I'm here because, you know, I hate music. Really. Like, uh, it never occurred to you, for instance, that uh, any fresh song and any government warning, the lyrics of any fresh song can be any government warning, like, Toss that the green, not in between, hey! You know, uh, Sergeant General's warning, serious will be made, be access to your help, hey! Thank you. 
I'm sure we all hung up the bird club. And it's a good thing he died when he did because that movie, A River Runs Through It, would have been about him. Hello, Rock Hero. Thank you very much. Good night. Well, Let's see what else we got here. 
Oh yeah, be sure and get those great stamps that the post office is putting out with all those comic strip characters. They're especially good for sending out resumes, you know, like uh, Little Orphan Annie, maybe. That would be good. Or um, they didn't have Boo McNutt, but that would have been a good one. Yeah, what's with them? They don't have Boo McNutt. They don't have Happy Hooligan. They don't have any of the really great ones. They don't even have Alice Cinders, for Christ's sake. Okay, here we go. I hate media, sex, and violence, but not enough to turn off the television. For truly, I am a slave to the media. However much I might attempt to struggle against its onslaughts, I am a slave to the media. And another thing that I've been uh, keeping track of is politics. Uh, for example, Steve Forbes. Steve Forbes acts like he wants to play polo with Bob Dole's head. And, and Phil Graham thinks that if he buys everybody uh, a birthday cake, then the GOP will think that the primaries are his birthday party. You know what I'm saying? So, uh, I don't know about that. Uh, of course, you know, I am not really uh, a fit person to um, give commentary on political events, which of course are weighty and important and of great consequence. And, you know, things that happened um, in 1996 are going to affect the rest of our lives in some way or another. Um, sure, yeah. That's right. Unless, of course, uh, you're, you're off harvesting locusts in Nebraska and you don't really give a daily squad who's running the country. It's all the same, right? Well, anyway, uh, I saw some soldiers in a job lot, the Ocean State job lot in Rhode Island, and uh, they were buying fruit cocktail and um, peanut butter bars. Good things for soldiers. And, and somebody asked them why they were dressed that way. And uh, they said, oh, we're going to Bosnia. And the saleswoman said, oh, I hope not. And they said, why? You know, like, this is their big chance. <laughs> and, and she's like trying to tell them that, uh, you know, they shouldn't be going off to fight in uh, sub-zero cold against two ill-defined enemies um, who are not only fighting each other, but anybody else that happens to be in the neighborhood. Uh, strewed, you know, a battlefield riddled, strewn with mines. And, and, you know, people don't even speak a, a, a European language, apparently. And, I mean, what do you want? You know, it's, it's not going to be a picnic lunch with Bozo, I'll tell you that much. Well, I think my time is just about up. I do want to get these things in, and uh, I, uh, I, I certainly appreciate your, uh, your kind patience. What the hell does that mean, anyway? I appreciate your kind patience. <laughs> They're great. You know, kill me, squash me, I'm a bug, you know. I'm an insect. And I have no right to live. Uh, let's see. Well, I don't know. I think I've just pretty much run out of new stuff here. And the other new stuff is um, actually old stuff that I've probably already done. So anyway, um, just remember, as Disraeli said to Gladstone, when you're out saving fallen women, save one for me. I'm the wrong hero. You are tuned to noise play.
to appease the angry volcano god. <laughs> and our dinosaurs kosher. <laughs> There's something that's been bothering me, and it's the Saturn car. Now, I was wondering, what were the marketing geniuses thinking of when they thought of the name for this car? What should we call our new car? Call it Mars? No. Too warlike. Call it Venus? No. We want to appeal to both males and females. I know. We'll call it Saturn. Devours his own children. That's <laughs> right name for a car. Here's the case to your new car, son. Gee, thanks, Steph. <laughs> Teenage Mutant Ninja 
edge of blubber. I can't believe it's not blubber. And blubber, come back to me. Please use the servant's entrance. 
the garbage in the kitchen? It wasn't garbage, no, day class said. It was designer filth. That was his name for it. His apartment was really something. It looked like the home of Lyme disease, really. There was a sign on the refrigerator, danger, biohazard three, authorized personnel only. And uh, you, you open up the refrigerator, it was like, There was one wilted head of lettuce, one pe half of a petrified lemon with a dragonfly encased in amber inside of it, two cans of generic beer dating from the Carter administration, and a monkey's paw with a jewel. You know, it was like the 12 days of Christmas for alcoholics. One wilted head of lettuce, one half of a petrified lemon, one monkey's paw!
and there was a historic plaque on the front of it. George Washington never came anywhere near this dump. Well, now that I'm finally moving out, I think I'm going to go into business for myself. I'm going to open up a line of heartless shelters. It's where heartless people go to hide from the homeless. But actually, I think um, we already have those to a certain degree. They're called suburbs. Oh, yeah. Ooh. Well, this episode of Wrong Hero has also been brought to you by Boob Over Butter. <laughs> Fuck you, margarine. And die, Lord, die.
down the street, and one was screaming at the other, you're talking stupid nonsense! You're talking stupid nonsense! Now, on yet another occasion, as I was crossing the street to get from the even side to the odd side of Massachusetts Avenue, right around the Purity Supreme, um, a homeless man said to me, Happy February. Of course, it was December at the time. Uh, so, yes, I've seen enough here to last me perhaps a lifetime. And although I am sorry to be moving out of here, um, if the truth be known, I actually moved out of here officially for tax purposes at the end of 1994. So actually, I haven't really been living here full time for the last 14 months. But um, I can see where it's going to start to become a time where at some time in the not too distant future, uh, I will probably have to remove the remainder of my belongings from this establishment. It may not be for another few months, or maybe even not for another several months, but um, that time will come. Uh, and I do still have a spare bedroom that I can utilize, which I do whenever I make my periodic jobs up to Cambridge. But I am now a resident of Providence, Rhode Island, and I do monthly shows at AS220, which is their performance space in Providence. As a matter of fact, next week you will be seeing footage shot live at AS220 in Providence, but that's a mere bag of shells. Well, we went through a number of roommates in rapid succession. Um, one of them was Dave. Uh, he had been going to the Harvard Business School, but he was the most stingy, cheap person you'd ever imagine. Um, he had a speech impediment, yet he desired to become a radio disc jockey, for which we used to tease him on merchant mercilessly. Uh, sorry, mercilessly, not unmercilessly. Uh, and well, eventually Dave moved out. He moved to Venice, California. Uh, and there's a whole series of amusing tales I could tell about that particular uh, visit we made to him out there. Well, basically, my friend Richard uh, and myself and uh, a cohort of others went to visit him. And he was trying to park this car in Venice, California, next to the Revival Theater, which was showing Todd Browning's Freaks. But he couldn't park it because he wasn't used to it. Um, I think it was a rental. And on the radio, the Dr. Demento show, I believe, there was this inane song which kept going, Pete Goetz, they pulled us. Pete Goetz, they pulled us. But the good news is, uh, not only did he get a ticket, but by the time we got to the Revival Theater, Freaks had already started, so they let us in for free. So we got to see uh, the last two hour and Ten minutes of this extraordinary film by Todd Browning. Um, David uh, was a Roman Catholic from Venezuela, but he converted to Judaism, and for drinks he offered us Mogan David wine, uh, which was difficult for us to drink because it's not that great a wine. I hate to say it. Um, well, let's see. Dave moved on. This fellow named John moved in. We put up an ad um, in the Harvard University Science Center advertising for a stingy tightwad uh, to come and live in our apartment since the rent was at the time only $225 and we had four people living here which meant $56.25 which of course back in those days, 1980-81, you could earn in just two days of doing temp work somewhere. So it was a pretty sweet life. La dolce vita, so to speak. And uh, what impressed me about John was that he wasn't uh, he didn't seem to be concerned at all that I was uh, working at Obon Pen as a dishwasher. He didn't look down his nose at me on that basis, and so I decided to give the little feller a chance. But he had this awful grating laugh. It was something like, ha <laughs> um, And he used to drive my other roommate, Eric, crazy. Eric moved in here because he was in a similar situation to my own after graduating from college, had no place to stay. So we put him up in the little room. Uh, which also faced the street. It had none of the advantages of the big room which faced the street um, because, as a matter of fact, it was virtually the size of a large walk-in closet virtually anywhere else. Uh, that's the only room in the house I haven't, in fact, ever actually had to live in. Uh, I have slept there on occasion, but never actually had to live there. Well, you know, then eventually Eric moved out and his father and Andrew moved in, and it was me, Andrew, and John, and John moved out. It was me and Andrew, and we used to have terrible fights about just about everything. Like the fact that he watched television all the time, and I used to torment him about that. And the fact that I used to like listen to records incessantly, and it drove him mad. And eventually he moved up and um, found a really small apartment. Um, and then uh, my friend Paul moved in, and he was a pretty good roommate. I mean, he never complained about anything, although by the time he moved up, he did warn the next fellow who was going to move in of my various peccadilloes, including leaving shaving hairs in the sink and allowing them to accumulate without ever once washing them out. And um, 
version of Sane in order to wrap this little interesting uh, collection of anecdota up. Here, in fact, are the beer cans of Mark. Now, that doesn't exactly amount to a pension plan, I'll admit, but you should have seen it before we undertook a concerted effort to clear out the debris. It, um, it basically went up over that sign, which is in fact um, Noise Party, which is in fact the show that you are tuned into. This, in fact, is my de facto recording studio. I am, in fact, the wrong hero. And very.
just now as the watchword of the wrong hero of the campaign for presidency of the United States. Now, people make vile accusations about the wrong hero, and of course that's politics. They're, they're, they're playing partisan politics, and uh, I don't have any part of it, uh, except insofar as it, uh, it, it accrues to my credit. Uh, some people say I drive a foreign car, that I fathered an illegitimate child, that I released a convicted murderer on furlough, that I steal free cable television, that I steal newspapers for recycling and sell them, that uh, I use drugs, I traffic in pornography, I've, I've been arrested for drunk driving on a suspended license. Some people say I raise taxes, cut police, resisted arrest, visit prostitutes regularly, run red lights, eat veal, and steal pennies from a blind man's cup. And to all of these charges, I have but one thing to say. Where is your proof that will stand up in court, you filthy monkeys? You don't want to steal, huh? Well, I'm sorry. You're the assonance, uh, old English major, uh, maybe the, perhaps the first literate person to ever run for uh, presidency in this country. Uh, apart from Gene McCarthy, we all know what happened to him, right? Uh, what happened to him? Well, after his failed 1968 candidacy, he periodically ran again and again for presidency. Of you remember Swagger? Oh, no, I don't remember that, but Pat Paulson was in the race, and he got more votes than Maury Taylor in New Hampshire. Now, there's something to remember. That's a real class from the past. Well, of course, you know, I'm not like Maury Taylor. I don't go to elementary schools and recommend that the children smoke cigars and make fun of them when they stutter. No, uh, that's not the way I operate. But I do want you to remember one important and pertinent fact. If the election were held today, it would be November. <laughs> now, when we finish your president, I promise immediate action. I promise, if elected, to send each and every one of you a brand new, bright, shiny, new penny. Please allow 46 weeks for delivery. Is this still a hack of Candace Bergen? No, this guy was purchased at Keezer's by a very dear friend of mine who, in fact, ran for the uh, Congress in Maryland and lost by a slender margin. See, so this guy has a very distinguished uh, pedigree. That's okay, but if you continue to interrupt me, Don't take it personal. 
Now, I promise to openly and candidly prevaricate in this race for president. Basically, I'm after the swing vote, and tomorrow I'll be speaking to the chimpanzees in the monkey house. <laughs> now, you may ask, where do I stand on some of the more poignant issues of our day? Well, as for school prayer, I'm in favor of a moment of silence in public schools and a moment of noise in Bible schools. <laughs> I support all affirmative action quotas, but only when they favor me. And I'm against the death penalty, except for people I just plain don't like. <laughs> now, I'm running this space with a lot of handicaps. I'm old, I'm repulsive, I'll steal anything that's not nailed down, and I'm too cynical to tell the truth. But at least I have something in common with every other person running for president this year. Now, as president, I promise that I will not abolish the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. Actually, no, I think I will abolish it, come to think of it, because that would give you a lot of votes down south. But I will not abolish alcohol, tobacco, or firearms, because now, Southerners wouldn't have anything to do on a Saturday night if I did that. Now, to conclude, some have said that the wrong hero exudes an air of silky menace. I find that very amusing, and I will hunt them down and destroy them at my leisure. In this race, I refuse to pander to the religious right, but I should mention that Jesus Christ God Almighty is my campaign manager. What this race really boils down to is that I am fearless. I say things out loud that the other candidates only whisper. Things like, hey mister, your flag is open. <laughs> things like, shut up, this is a library. <laughs> things like, excuse me please, but I have laryngitis. <laughs> Basically, the reason I'm running this race boils down to one word, stupidity. I was stupid. I came in second in a stupidity contest because I was stupid. But, you know, it's only fair that stupid people have representation because, after all, um, stupid people deserve representation even if they're too stupid to realize it. So anyway, as I conclude my speech, I'd just like to mention that politics is sports for people who are too fat to run. I'm the wrong hero. Vote for me. Come to them.
I'd like to ask God a few questions, if I may. But first, I'm wondering about um, bumper stickers in hell. Do they have cars in hell? Or do they have bicycles? I don't know. But if they do have cars in hell, they must have bumper stickers. And uh, I was thinking, what would some of these be? I break for Bumlock. Or uh, my other car is a pitchfork. Or welcome to sunny hell, a sinner's playground. Or if you don't like how I drive, kiss my nether regions. Or what the here are you looking at? Don't blame me. I voted for McGovern. Look at the bright side. This sure beats working at McDonald's. Of course, my two favorite bumper stickers, the ones I'll have on my car in hell, will be Ask Me About My Eternal Torment and Honk If You've Betrayed Our Lord. Those are the ones I want. I have a riddle for you. What's the difference between a monastery and a hobo jungle? Hobos are, I'm sorry, monks are fat and they shave. Anyway, questions I'd like to ask God. If you ask God if he exists and he says no, should you believe him? Does the universe lose its flavor on the bedpost overnight? On the seventh day, God rested. What did he do on the eighth day? Bowl? What if Noah had gotten drunk and said, Hey, fuck it! Throw the animals overboard! Bring the fish up here! Was Moses the first comedian? And if he was, he must have been thousands of years ahead of his time. Burning bushes, stone tablets, talking to God. Sounds like a 70s drug comedian to me, you know? If you get Yahweh and you use it as a Scrabble word, do you get the extra 50 points? Is it true that you can't love God unless God loves himself? All right, I'm going to get down to the nitty gritty now. If God is all powerful, then why doesn't the alphabet begin with the letter G? Is static clean God's way of trying to tell us something? Is there a special God whistle only He can hear? Some questions about the New Testament, Ben. Moving right along. Can you kill the Holy Ghost or is it too late? When Mary was pregnant with Jesus, did she drink coffee? If, if Joseph was such a hotshot carpenter, why didn't he make a nice cradle for the baby Jesus? When Jesus took a bath, did he used to walk up the shower nozzle? And did he leave his face on all the towels? He changed water into wine at the wedding of Cana. Wasn't that enabling behavior? Some other questions. Did he turn a water cooler into a wine cooler? Did he turn white water rafting into white wine rafting? Did he turn a water closet into a wine cellar? Now you know that Jesus said, Render unto Caesar what is Caesar's, and render unto God what is God's. At the Last Supper, did he order the Caesar's salad? And also at the Last Supper, did he order the loaves and fishes buffet, or would that have been redundant? Or did he just get order one dish and then multiply it by 12 and uh, turn all the water into wine just to like stiff the waiter? I'm curious, that's all. Now, if God's blood is wine, does that mean he was always drunk? Get off that donkey! Blow into the breathalyzer! 100!
before I picked up the cross to go to Mount Calvary, did he do little stretching exercises first? And also, when he was on trial, was he tempted to use the crown of thorns as a frisbee? Now, when he was there at the crucifixion, was his high school gym coach there going, Come on, you sissy, walk it off, walk it off! And was the crucifixion just a dice game that went terribly, terribly wrong? Now, when he was being crucified, did he pretend he was in the airplane? Hey, there's Pontius Pilate, take that! Hey, Peter, I can see your house from here. Did the, at at, at Jesus' grave, did angels really roll away the stone, or was it juvenile delinquents? And when Jesus died and went to heaven, who got custody of the halo? Why don't you have devil worshippers on television asking for money to fight God? If we're, if we're going to have a moment of prayer in public schools, shouldn't we have a moment of noise in Bible schools? Well, before I go, I'd like to tell you my personal belief. Some say God is dead. I say, God is not dead. He just doesn't like crowds. That's why you seldom see him in a church. I can tell a joke. A guy walked into a bar and ordered a hydrogen ricky. And the bartender said, we don't get many gods in here. And God replied, there is only one God. Two, now, God is in the details, and I wish you'd get out of here. I'm getting out of here. Okay, that was the fatalistic, metaphysical, wrong hero. And that outfit is featured in this month's issue of GQ. Okay, soon we're going to bring up our feature racks. We're going to have a couple of guys come up and play 20-minute uh, sets. I'll get passing the hat around for them later on. The suggested contribution is about two Was that the cherry laid? But anyway, yeah, it's a, it's a great little playhouse. <laughs> you just said Kathy Lee, or whatever the hell. I hate these two people. Are they like the most contemptible people you've ever seen in your life? Regis with this insinuating, smarmy, oily delivery, Dolly with her fiery eyes. Oh, I'm just a dumb country girl. Oh, come off it, please. Jesus Christ. But anyway, I'll tell you what. Let's get a better look at that. Let's change it. 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 Let's some of the background of some of these uh, uh, programs that you've uh, patiently sat through. Um, I apologize for the video quality of them. Um, and uh, anyway, <clears throat> officially, uh, I believe uh, the uh, second Monday of the month open mic at Cafe Liberty started in January of 1995. Actually, Initially, it wasn't a second Monday of the month event. The first one was, I believe, on January 30th or 31st. But um, in any event, it's been running now for a year and four months. Um, there's been 15 of them, as far as I know. Let's see, January, February, March, April, May, June, July, August, November, October, November, December. Uh, they skipped January of 96 because of the blizzard. But uh, February, March, April, there's been 15 of them so far. And I've managed to appear at... Um, Let's see, uh, August, September, October, November, December, February, March, April, uh, eight of them. Uh, and the thing is, I was even at the one in January, which wasn't officially a Live at Cafe Liberty event, but a Stone Soup event, since because of the blizzard in January, Stone Soup bumped over to Cafe Liberty. And lucky they did, too, um, because then they offered me a feature slot, which I will take them up on as soon as I have a single moment's spare time to myself. You think this is easy, putting together two two-hour shows every week? What, do you think I'm crazy that this is all I do, that I make a living from? Oi, 
You know, and so uh, anyway, uh, this is as good a time as any to announce, uh, first of all, that, um, snurf, that uh, uh, we'll be doing reruns over the summer, not reruns per se. None of this is, uh, none of the summer material on Cafe Cabaret or Noise Party, well, very little of it on, none of it on Noise Party and relatively little of it on Cafe Cabaret will be material that you have seen before. I can't guarantee it. Uh, we'll be showing old blues views from 1990. Um, during the summer on this program, and uh, so the wrong hero will be taking a break, I believe, during some, if not much, of the summer. Um, and on uh, Noise Party, which uh, many of these uh, open mics were originally broadcast on, we'll be showing reggae jams all summer. So um, that you guys can take a break. You can uh, be outside at night and uh, walk around, and you don't have to stay and, and watch television and uh, be compulsive about seeing every single one of the 300 shows that I promise I will bring Cafe Cabaret and Noise Party to. Uh, right now, let's see, we're probably on uh, Cafe Cabaret number 251 or 2 or 3 or something like that. Mm -hmm. So that means i got 50 more to go. Uh, and on Noise Party, we're probably in the 270s now, so i got about 30 more to go. Um, but uh, yes, I, I'm going to make this a 300 show project uh, for both shows. That means I will have shown 600 shows, 600 two-hour shows, some of them actually two-hour and 43-minute shows, and I'll be in syndication until the year 2010 with that much material. Not that all of it is worthy of broadcast, mind you, but uh, anyway, um, I just wanted to uh, give you a little background. Uh, Jim Rader sort of picked this up um, right after um, the Middle East got rid of their open mic, which was every Saturday. Um, Jim Rader sort of started this thing, which is once a month, because the logistics of doing a weekly open mic are staggering, of course. Um, and uh, not that I wouldn't do it again if I were to be paid a certain decent amount of money, uh, but uh, still, uh, it's, it's a hard life, and it takes away uh, from a lot of fun that you might otherwise have, having to come up with material, or even having to repackage old material. Um, it's a very time consuming thing uh, running and performing at an open mic on a weekly basis. So now I'm down to two shows a month, sometimes three, and uh, that's a lot more manageable a schedule, although um, your skills do tend to deteriorate and uh, you know you sort of interlard your speeches with a lot of ums and errs and you forget to say anything that's funny but you just sort of ramble on at unconscionable length and uh, eventually you decide that you don't have anything more to say and so you put the fade on and, uh, and then you show the logo if in fact you uh, are competent enough to have had a logo prepared ahead of time. Oh, don't tell me this whole thing, the whole time this was on fade or what? Or, uh, no, okay, that's good. That would have been a nightmare. Uh, so, um, anyway. I'm sure you'd like to see this, the kitties walking in the park, if I can get them before we run out of uh, time here. Whoa, dum 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 dum, oh, looks like we won't have time to show you the kitties in the park. Wow, look at that. E you would think that that's incredibly bright, but it's not, just that I have the iris open all the way. Uh, let's see, the kitties are walking up the path, whoops, no, you can't see it all, can you? There you go, whoops, no, it's getting that delicate balance that's so hard. There's a car driving down the street, and uh, we missed the kitties, but uh, anyway, 